and there was light. The light shines in the darkness. Good morning, Station Hill. It's great to see y'all. I am excited to hear God speak to us today through his word. If you're visiting with us today, I want to thank you for spending your Sunday morning here with us. It's my prayer that you would be encouraged in our time together, whether you follow Jesus already or you're considering what it means to follow Jesus for the first time. We're just thankful that you're here. I want to invite everyone to go ahead and open their Bibles to Isaiah chapter 42. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 4 in our time together today. If you're using the Bible that we provided under the seats in front of you, you can find the passage beginning on page 637. And if you don't own a copy of God's Word for yourself, we want to invite you to take the copy that we've provided as a gift from us to you. And if you're new to navigating the Bible, when you get to page 637, you're looking for the big bold number 42. That's the chapter number, Isaiah 42. We're going to be looking at the smaller numbers, one to four after that. Uh, I'd love to start our time today with a question. And that question is, can anybody name for me a president of our country who was able to carry out and establish perfect justice? figure that would be the answer. Okay, so hey, let's broaden the scope then. Let's just not think about our country. Let's go outside of our country. Can anybody name for me the last head of state of any nation in the world who was able to carry out and establish perfect justice? All right, let's, let's think about throughout human history now. Can anybody name a king or queen or any ruler ever who was able to carry out and establish a perfect and lasting justice in their nation? Jesus. (laughs) Somebody answered that in the last service. That that is like the message of my sermon. But we're thinking of human rulers, human kings, not the God-man. Right, if I preach uh, Jesus right now, that, that just basically short circuits the whole, whole sermon. That's what we're getting to. We're going to see that Jesus is the true ruler, right? But I want you to think about this. Not one ruler ever, apart from Jesus, has ever been able to establish perfect and lasting justice. Even the best of rulers this world has ever known were unable to carry out or establish a perfect and lasting justice, which leaves us to conclude one of two things. Either it cannot and will not ever be done, or second, we just haven't yet met the person who can do it. I think those are the two options we have before us. And if our passage this morning is telling us the truth, then there is a person who's coming who will establish a perfect and lasting justice throughout the entire earth. And that is good glorious news for us today. As we continue our sermon series through the entire Bible, we're in a stretch of three sermons from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet. He was sent to the southern kingdom of Judah, and he was sent to tell the people of Israel in Judah about the exile that they were going to be sent into because of their sins. But the second part of Isaiah's message to those same people was that he, he brought to them a message of comfort, And a promise that God would send a savior to rescue them from exile and bring them back into his presence. Last week, we learned that this savior would be a king who would rule over a kingdom that would never end. And this week, we learned that this coming savior is not only a king, he's also a servant. A servant whose mission it is to establish justice in all the earth. So I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. I'm going to open our time by reading Isaiah chapter 42, verses one to four for us. You can follow along in your own Bible or on the screen behind me as I read. This is God's word. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or be discouraged 
until he has established justice on earth. The coasts and islands will wait for his instruction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that by your grace and your mercy, you would be pleased to pour out your spirit upon us this morning to give us eyes to behold the servant and king, Jesus Christ, who came to lay down his life for the pardoning of our iniquity and for restoring right order in all the earth and to invite us into a relationship with you, the living God. We pray that we would all lay hold of Jesus Christ by faith this morning and that you would be pleased to sanctify us by your spirit to walk in his justice-bringing ways in the days ahead. And we pray that you would do this for your glory and for our good and all God's people said, amen. Friends, you can go ahead and be seated. If you're taking notes this morning, the glorious news that Isaiah has for God's people is that God's anointed servant will establish perfect justice in all the earth in a surprising way. God's anointed servant will establish perfect justice in all the earth in a surprising way. And if you're taking notes, we're gonna break down this passage into three separate points. Point one, we're gonna see the servant foretold or predicted. Point two, we're gonna see the servant fulfilled. And then point three, we're gonna think about application. What this passage means for us, point three will be the servant emulated. So first, the servant foretold. What we notice about verses one to four is that they're a prediction, a prophecy of a servant of the Lord who from Isaiah's standpoint in history, 700 years before the birth of Christ, was coming in the future to establish perfect justice in all the earth. But before we consider the justice that he'll bring, I want us to consider and notice first how unique this servant will be. I want you to notice first his unique anointing. Go ahead and look with me at verse one. You see that he is strengthened by God himself. When this servant comes, he'll know a special empowering and sustaining by God for the difficult task of establishing justice on earth. If he ever grows weak or fearful, he'll have the powerful hand of God to strengthen him. But not only is he strengthened by God, if you look again at verse one, you also notice that he's chosen by God. There's no one else who can carry out the task that God has chosen him to carry out on earth. More than that, God delights in him, we see in verse one. That means God loves him and rejoices over him. That is to say, he is God's chosen and beloved servant. But not only is he strengthened by God, chosen by God, and loved by God, he's also anointed with God's spirit. What does verse one say? I, the living God, have put my spirit on him. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, then this phrase might ring a bell, right? In in the Old Testament, when God's spirit comes upon a person, he empowers them to accomplish miraculous feats. You see this especially in the books of Judges and Kings. So like those people, but in a way far greater than those people, this servant will be specially anointed by God's spirit. It's as though God's spirit will descend on him and rest on him in a special way for the task that God has given him. And what is that task? Look at the last line of verse one. God's chosen, beloved, and spirit-endowed servant is being sent to bring forth justice. That's the dominant theme of these four verses. Isaiah repeats it three times. You see it in verse one, then again at the end of verse three, and then again in verse four. The servant's task is to bring forth justice and he won't stop until it is perfectly established. And it's crucial here at this point that we understand the way the word justice is used in the Old Testament if we're gonna rightly understand what the servant's task actually is. Uh, We think of justice today more in a narrower category than the Hebrew word for justice is used. It has a much broader meaning than our word for justice. 
So in Hebrew, it can refer, like our word justice, to narrow, narrowly to just legal decisions and judgments, but far more often, it refers broadly to restoring right order, putting things back the way they ought to be, right? So this beloved servant, this anointed servant is coming with the expansive mission of restoring right order and putting things back the way they ought to be in the whole earth. And I want you to notice that the justice he's bringing, right, isn't just for the nation of Israel. He's not just bringing it to the nation of Israel, but in verse one, he's gonna bring it to the nations. And in verse four, he's gonna bring it in all the earth such that the coastland peoples of Tyre and Sidon in Isaiah's day who weren't Israelites, such that even they will hope in him and wait on him. The servant isn't only putting things the way they ought to be in Israel, he's gonna put things back the way they ought to be in the whole earth. And he's gonna do this in the most remarkable way. Right, you, you, you and I would expect that if someone is gonna come and establish justice in a fallen world, they're gonna have to come with a sword or, or with a gun or with an army or with pomp and circumstance. They're gonna have to be proud and belligerent, unabashedly self-centered, demanding their own way, right? Doing whatever it takes to get people to fall in line, to execute justice. But I want you to notice the servant's demeanor. Look at verse two. He's not gonna cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. That is to say, he's gonna do his work in an understated way. He won't be rude or arrogant. He's not gonna shout people down or draw attention to himself. In other words, he'll be humble. And shockingly, he'll be tender. I don't know about you, but tender, tenderness isn't the first word I think of when a king comes to establish justice in all the earth. But, but this king, this servant will be tender. Look at verse three. He won't break a bruised reed. He won't put out a smoldering wick. The bruised reed and faintly burning wick refer to people who've been crushed by the pain, sorrow, sadness and injustice in the world. They're just barely hanging on. If, if one more thing comes along and wounds them, they will be completely crushed and the servant will be tender with those people. He won't treat them as others treat them. He won't look down on them. He won't crush them with his demands. He won't have the attitude of those who rule in this world telling them to just get in line. His way will be one of humility and tenderness as he establishes justice. And he'll be completely faithful in, bringing out his, in carrying out his work. Look at verse four. He won't grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. Isaiah says he won't grow weak or be discouraged. He won't grow faint because the servant is gonna have lots of reasons to grow faint and be discouraged because he's gonna face opposition in his work. Uh, this passage about this coming servant is actually one of four predictions of a coming servant in the second half of Isaiah's book. These passages are often known as the servant songs. This is the first of those servant songs or the second, I think. And each one of the servant songs prophesying this coming servant builds on the previous one. And it fleshes out more and more how this servant will carry out justice in all the earth. And the final servant song, the most famous servant song is Isaiah 53, the passage of the suffering servant, where we learn that the servant will bear the inflictions that, we, that his people deserve in his own body. He will, that is to say, he will have many reasons to grow faint and be discouraged as he gives his life for his very own people. But no matter what difficulty he faces, what opposition and persecution he suffers, Isaiah wants us to know he won't be stopped. He won't grow faint. He won't be discouraged. He's gonna complete the task that he was sent for. But who? is this servant. 
Who is this anointed servant, this humble and tender servant who will faithfully establish justice in all the earth? And when would he come? Well, that brings us to point two, the servant fulfilled. This prophecy of God's anointed servant is part of a larger message of comfort for God's people that begins back in chapter 40. So the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are largely predictions of coming judgment. If you've ever read it and you're like, wow, this is a ton of judgment. You're right, (laughs) it's meant to feel that way. And then finally you get to Isaiah 40 and the message turns from judgment to one of comfort and hope and future salvation for God's people. In the last 26 chapters of Isaiah, God is essentially saying to the people of Israel, even though you are going into exile, all hope is not lost. I will come for you. I will send my servant to rescue you. That's the message of chapters 40 to 66. So I want you to look with me, turn in your Bible if you have to, to chapter 40. You'll see what happens in the text. And I think that's gonna help you to see who this servant is. Chapter 40 begins with words of comfort, comfort, comfort my people. If you've ever been to Handel's Messiah, it's one of my favorite verses in the entire uh, entire performance when God sings comfort to his afflicted and exiled people. Verses one and two are God's promise to Israel of comfort that he will one day bring them back from exile. Israel's iniquity will one day be pardoned. So if you're an Israelite and you're, you're hearing this or you're reading this, you're gonna wanna know, when is this going to happen? When is this prediction of iniquity pardoned and return from exile and comfort, when is this going to happen? Look at verse three of chapter 40. The very next thing Isaiah says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God is saying to Israel, the promised time of restoration when I gather you out of exile will happen when I myself come in the wilderness to pardon your iniquity and bring you back to myself. When we turn to the New Testament, We see that passage from Isaiah quoted in three of the four gospels in reference to Jesus. After John the Baptist cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, who shows up? The Lord incarnate, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lord appearing in the wilderness, come to pardon his people's iniquity. So you might be asking, what on earth does this have to do with the passage about the servant? Great question. It has everything to do with it. I want you to turn back to Isaiah 42. In all three gospels, after Jesus appears in the wilderness, fulfilling the passage from Isaiah 40 about the Lord appearing, the very next thing that he does is gets baptized, right? And what happens during his baptism? The heavens part and the spirit descends on him like a dove. Isaiah 42, verse one, behold my servant, I have put my spirit upon him. Then after the spirit descends, what does the voice from heaven say? This is my beloved son. With him, I am well pleased. Isaiah 42, verse one, behold my servant, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Jesus is the beloved chosen servant of the Lord. The Lord is Jesus and Jesus is the servant come to rescue his people from exile so that their iniquities can be pardoned and so that justice can spread throughout all the earth. And that's exactly what Jesus was sent to do. He was sent to bring forth justice by declaring God's just judgments to man and by restoring all things to their proper order. And that's exactly what he sets about doing immediately after his baptism. You just read through the gospels and see this, right? He enters Galilee and he begins preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God calling all people to repent and believe, declaring to all people that God's justice is perfect and that God will carry out a just punishment on all who've sinned. And not only does he declare the truth about God to man, he then sets about restoring all things to their proper order by 
healing the sick, by giving sight to the blind, by opening the ears of the deaf. In all of these things, he's showing his power to bring about the expansive justice that God envisions by restoring the physical world. This is not the way that the world was supposed to be. Sickness and death and disease and things like blindness and deafness and lameness and people being paralyzed. This is not the way the world was supposed to be. And he is writing that world. He is restoring that world, showing that he is the one with the power to do it. He is healing disease and sickness and death, but more than restoring the physical world, those healings point to the spiritual disorder that exists in the hearts of all mankind. All of us, just like the Israelites in the Old Testament have chosen to reject God and to sin against him. And because of that choice, we're all in a state of spiritual exile from God. And Jesus has come to bring God's justice into the world by restoring all things to the right order. What was the right order in Genesis chapter one? Mankind lived with God in perfect relationship with God. But our sins have separated us from God. They have separated us from from an unpassable chasm that we cannot cross on our own. And Jesus has come into the world to pay the price for our sins and to open the way back into God's holy and beloved and glorious presence. And he is restoring that right order in the world through the preaching of the gospel. Jesus came to bring forth the expansive justice of God. And just like the servant in Isaiah, Jesus would carry out his task, not in prideful arrogance, but in humility. The large crowds gathered around him. They didn't gather around him because of his own self-promotion, but because of his authoritative teaching and his miraculous work. He didn't cry aloud or lift up his voice in the streets. He didn't seek to draw attention to himself. In fact, if you read the gospels, Jesus often says, don't tell people about me. Like, what is going on here? Why don't you want people to know about this? Because the time has not yet come. My, my plan has not yet been fulfilled. Then you can talk about me. But his, his ministry was not only marked by understatement and humility, it was also marked by tenderness. A bruised reed he would not break and a faintly burning wick he would not quench. Friends, think of his glorious tenderness. Recall his healing of the leper. The man who had been separated from the rest of Israel because of his disease. He didn't want to fear people contracting his disease, so he had to live as an outcast of Israel. Unable to have close communion with people, unable to feel people's physical touch. But that is not the way the world is supposed to be. So when Jesus steps near to the leper, he does not only draw near to him, what does he do? Touches him and says, be clean. He's restoring things to the way they ought to be, but it's not just the healing of the leper that shows us his tenderness. Consider the woman who'd been suffering from the issue of blood for years, or the pagan woman whose daughter was possessed by a demon, or the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus didn't come to trample down the weak, but to stoop down to them and say to them, it's okay. I'm here, I'm gonna strengthen you in your weakness. I'm gonna draw near to you. Even though the rest of the world will not draw near to you, I will draw near to you. And not only was he humble, but he was faithful. He would not grow faint or be discouraged. And he would have plenty of reasons, right? Think about the opposition he faced from the Pharisees, from his own family from Herod and the Romans. And their opposition was so fierce that it would bring him to the point of giving up. Think about him in the garden. Father, if it be your will, let this cup of judgment pass from me. I I don't want it, but not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus took that cup and he drank it down to the dregs because he will not grow faint. He will not be discouraged until justice, is, until justice is carried out in all the earth. And so Jesus would go to the cross. He would go to the place where God's justice would be brought forth and established for all to see. Oh friends, what, what does the cross teach us but that God is just? God will punish sin justly. He's not going to let sin go unpunished. He's not going to be bribed. He's not going to show favoritism. He will perfectly punish all sin, all injustice, and all oppression. But 
The cross isn't the only place, isn't, isn't only the place where, see, where we see God's justice brought forth. It's also the place where we see God's mercy. As the servant, Jesus taught that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to give his life mercifully to those of us who are in the chains, uh, the spiritual chains of bondage to slavery, to sin. And he came to set us free from those chains by paying his life, his blood, his perfect life as a ransom for our sins. He came to give his life to pay for our sins. For us bruised reeds and us faintly burning wicks, Jesus Christ proclaims, look to me. On the cross, my reed was crushed and my wick was snuffed out so that you could be healed and given life so that your iniquity could be pardoned and that your, right, your relationship with God could be restored to right order. He was killed on the cross for our sins and buried, but because he is the true reed and the flame that cannot be quenched, he didn't stay dead. Three days after he was buried, he rose victorious from the dead. And now he calls all people everywhere to repent and to believe in him for the forgiveness of sins. And friends, that offer stands for you today. You might be one of those people who perhaps you followed Jesus earlier in life, but you've been wayward for a number of years and you've fallen into all sorts of sin. And you think, listen, there's, there's no way that God can accept me. There's no way that God will accept me. He's gonna see what I've done and there's no way that he's gonna allow me back into his presence. But friend, if that is you today, hear God say to you about his servant son, Jesus Christ, he will not break a bruised reed. He will not quench a smoldering wick. If you are at the end of yourself, if that flame is barely holding on, if the thing is just barely glowing with anything at all, Jesus Christ will bring you into his presence and by his spirit and power, he will blow his life-giving breath upon your wick so that you might have life. It doesn't matter what you've done. God will bring you into his presence. Think of the parable of the prodigal son. One of the most beautiful displays of the father's love for his wayward children in all of scripture. He's gonna humiliate himself running to you and embracing you while you stand far off. And that's what he did on the cross. He bore our humiliation and our shame in order to restore our relationship with God, in order to pardon us of our iniquity. Friend, don't wait another moment to come to Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus Christ right now and be saved. That is the message for you today. And listen, through the last 2,000 years, as men and women and children have acknowledged their sins and their need of a savior, and they have turned to Jesus Christ in, in, by faith, God has been restoring right order in the world. He's been freeing those same men and women and children from the curse of sin and preparing them for life in his everlasting kingdom where sin and injustice will be no more. And as he prepares us for that kingdom, he's also working to sanctify us by his spirit so that we would grow in loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Here, O Israel, the Lord is one, right? And so that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Or to put it another way, for those who have repented and trusted in Jesus, God is sanctifying us so that we would follow in our Savior's steps by acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. And that brings us to our third and final point, the servant emulated. The servant emulated. If we have received God's tender mercy and the forgiveness of sins, those of us who've trusted in Jesus now participate in the mission of the servant to bring justice to the world around us. And broadly speaking, if you want to think of, think of this in categories and you're taking notes, broadly speaking, we do that in two ways. We participate in that mission in two ways. We participate in the servant's mission of bringing justice by obeying the great commission and by obeying the great commandment. I want us to finish out our time with the next few minutes are, that we have by thinking about each of those things in turn. We participate in Jesus' mission of establishing justice by obeying the Great Commission. Jesus' mission of bringing justice to the world has as its chief end, the highest thing that he is aiming for in it is 
the salvation of souls from God's judgment against sin and the restoration of mankind into right relationship with God. And insofar as we want to see God's justice established in the world, we need to give ourselves to carrying out the great commission and calling people to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to seeing them restored to a right relationship with God. This is why we as a church put so much emphasis on our mission as a church. What's our mission as a church? To engage the whole person with the whole gospel anytime, anywhere, and with anybody because we realize that the most loving thing and just thing that we can aim to do for a person is to see them freed from slavery to sin and reconciled to God through the good news of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul in Romans 1 talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. He's drawing on imagery from the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament day, well, even in his day, when wars were fought, Battles would be fought and one side would win, one side would lose. The winning side would send a messenger back to the city and that messenger would come running with good news. So people would say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of victory and salvation, right? Our side has won. When Paul talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, he's saying your feet and mine are beautiful because we bring the most powerful message in all creation that through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus Christ, that those who repent and believe in Jesus Christ will be set free from their bondage to sin, will be set free from Satan's power in their life so that if they trust in Jesus, they would be able to sing with us this morning, one little word will fell him. God will become their fortress. God will become their refuge. They will worship the one who is the name above every name. Friends, that, that is the most loving and just thing that we could do for a person to see them restored to a right relationship with God through faith in King Jesus, the servant king. So friends, I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you afresh. I know evangelism is something that we talk a lot about, as we should, right? One of the most important things we do as Christians. But when something is talked about a lot, it can often lose its power. I see this with my kids when I tell them things repeatedly. It seems like they get stronger in not listening with each time I say it. It's like the, the message loses its power more and more. Like, wait, I'm saying it more and more. Why aren't, you, why aren't you listening? And we don't want regularly talking about evangelism to have that effect on us. We talk about it a lot because of how important it is and how glorious of a privilege it is that we get to participate in sharing the greatest news that has ever been shared in all creation. So I wanna challenge you in the week to come to take stock of the relationships you have in your life and to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel with those people. I think about one of, my, one of the most impactful books in this area for me was a book called The Art of Neighboring. And the one thing that stood out to me from that book that I still remember to this day is they have this map, this fake map of any neighborhood in the world, right? And, and they ask the question, if you, if you live on this map, here are the houses that are around you, who are the people that live in those houses? What are their names? What are their jobs? What are their stories? And I was ashamed the first time I read through the book, I was like, I actually don't think I can fill out the map really at all. I maybe know a few details of it. I, I wonder what that would look like for you. If, if you were to make a map, of your, a map of your neighborhood and you were to list out the, the three houses on each side of you and across the street from you, how much would you be able to fill in of their names, their jobs, their stories? I, I bring this up because when it comes to obeying the Great Commission, Part of obeying the Great Commission is getting to know the people around us. And in those conversations where we learn more and more about them, we often have opportunities to turn the conversation to Jesus. I don't know about you, I, I often fall prey to praying to God. God, please give me opportunities today to share the gospel. And God doesn't say this to me audibly, but I, I do feel like from time to time, he just impresses on my heart, John, the, the opportunity's all around you. 
You, you need to step out in boldness and, and talk about Jesus. I think what I'm waiting for is some person I've never met before, a complete stranger to walk up to me on the street and say, uh, sir, will you tell me about the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation that can be had in him? Where I, I should be like, yes. And, and maybe over the course of my life, maybe I'll, I'll have somebody like the Ethiopian eunuch who's sitting down reading the book of Isaiah when I sit down next to them. And they're like, can you tell me about the suffering servant who died for the sins of God's people? But like, yeah, I can do that for you. But most often I think God is calling us to go to engage in those conversations. I want you to think about your neighbors and the opportunities that you have to engage with them in the week to come. When you see them outside, engage with them in conversation. Ask, what's their name? After you learn their name, engage them in another conversation another time, learn about their job. After you've learned about their job, learn about what's hard in their life, what's going going well in their life. You, You have opportunities to engage in those conversations where you can turn the conversation to Jesus Christ. And I'm sure a lot of you are are surrounded by people who at least would call themselves Christians and maybe they are, maybe they aren't, you're trying to figure it out. But anytime you have the conversation, they're like, no, I'm a believer. And you're like, well, I don't know what to do now uh, since, you know, that they basically like diffused my bomb, uh, right? Well, what you can do is ask them, hey, you're a Christian. Would you want to read a book of the Bible with me? Would you want to read this Christian book with me? Look for ways to engage them in conversation about the gospel. We have the greatest news in all the earth and God has given us this news, each one of us to participate in that mission by sharing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. The second way that we obey, that we can uh, participate in this mission of bringing justice to the world is by obeying the great commandment. We bring justice by obeying the great commandment to loving the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and by loving our neighbor as ourselves. I want to talk to the young kids here, especially definitely those who have siblings. So you don't need to have siblings to to listen here. Uh, You might hear about partnering with God to establish justice on earth and think, this, this means absolutely nothing to me. And if you're a young kid and you're thinking that, don't worry, I've been there, been in your shoes before, right? But I want to connect for you how you can actually obey God and follow Jesus and help to be a force for bringing justice in the world and your life in the week ahead. Especially if you're an older sibling, I'm guessing that at times your younger siblings annoy you or frustrate you or do something to make you really mad. And you can either respond by going, go! I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna throw a swing. That you shouldn't be doing that, right? But like, you, you, you get you get amped up. You're like, what are you doing? Like, leave, take my. I want my toy back. Hey, here's how you can follow Jesus and establish justice by following the Savior. What is? What, what do we learn about Jesus in the passage? That he is not going to break a bruised reed or put out a smoldering wick, right? kids, especially if you're an older sibling and you're tempted to be harsh with your younger siblings, you can fight against that and restore right order by not returning evil for evil and instead being gentle and tender with your siblings. But it's not just in your your sibling groups. I want you to think about where you go to school. Maybe it's homeschool, private school, public school, in your sports teams, in children's ministry in the back. If you see kids being picked on or other groups of kids are laughing at another kid or there's a child in your, uh, in your group that's being set apart, they're not, they're not being involved in the group, you can participate in this mission of bringing justice to the world by standing up for those who are being picked on and by standing up for those who are being mistreated. This is where I really wanna to talk to the teens as well. Uh, This is so important for you all because as you move into the teen years, the mistreatment that we might experience in life tends to get more vicious and more heartbreaking, Uh, right? Harder stuff can happen. Uh, You might see it online. You might hear about gossip and lies in school or in your youth ministry or on your sports teams. And the call for you, if you are following in the servant steps, is to fight for justice by standing up for those who are being mistreated. I think one course of action that adults often fall to when they, when they hear about their teens and perhaps injustice that is going on in the lives of their teens, they think, well, tell a, tell a teacher, tell another adult. And you're like, that's the worst thing that you could, like, I can't do that because if I do that, then it's gonna get a lot worse for me. In fact, studies show uh, that when students ask for help from adults, 
what they're experiencing gets even worse. But here's the thing, studies also show that if a peer stands up to the one who's doing the mistreating, it often stops. I wanna encourage you, if you are in uh, you know, relationships with your friends and there are people being mistreated, lied about, bad pictures being sent around, you, 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 can, you can come up with the list of things, right? I wanna encourage you, if you're following Jesus, to be the one that stands up, to be the one that pushes back the darkness, to the one who's fighting by the spirit of God in you to restore right order in the world. You might say, hey man, that's, that's, I can't do that. That's gonna be embarrassing, that's gonna be hard. Yes, and it was hard for Jesus. The darkness does not like the light, but here's the good news for you. The spirit of Christ that is in you will strengthen you. God will uphold you. You've been united to Jesus Christ by faith. God will be with you as you call out the darkness and seek to see God's justice established in the world. This isn't just for kids and teens though. This is for adults as well. And this isn't just for adults thinking about the world around us. This needs to happen in the church also. I don't know if it's a surprise to you, but when people become Christians, they don't automatically become portraits of perfection. Uh, All the hard stuff in our life doesn't just go away. No, God gives us his spirit, leads us on a journey to become more like Jesus. And one of the things that we do in the church is help one another address the injustice in their lives. And so whether it's spouses, if we become aware of spouses being abused physically or emotionally or otherwise, if we become aware of Christians who are, have believed in Jesus but who are struggling with addiction, uh, if we hear about lies and gossip being spread in the church, we, we need to be a congregation of people who stand up and who help those who are experiencing injustice because in partnership with God and following Jesus, he is expanding justice to fill the whole earth. It's part of being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ on this side of heaven. And listen, that work is hard. And that's why we talk about being involved in discipling relationships where you know other people deeply and other people know you deeply because really it's only in the context of those types of relationships where people are gonna share with you the hard things that are going on in their lives. But we, we, we dive into those relationships, we seek to build them because we know that God has so much good for us in them. And I realize discipling relationships, fighting, just, fighting for justice and injustice, sharing the gospel, all that can seem discouraging and tiring and overwhelming. But even when it seems like things are dark and it's overwhelming and the battle seems too big, we don't need to grow faint or be discouraged. Why? Because Jesus Christ ultimately will bring justice to the ends of the earth. Where you and, our, where you and I are right now on this side of heaven is more like the battle of Helm's Deep in the Lord of the Rings after the orcs have broken down the wall and darkness has spread, right? One of, the, one of the more intense battle scenes there are, and if you're watching it, it's terrifying because darkness is spreading. There's no way that that army is gonna beat the, battle, the, the powers of darkness, but then what happens? Gandalf the White appears on the mountain, the riders of Rohan appear behind him, and they come rushing down the mountain and destroy and decimate the orcs and drive back the darkness. Friends, where you and are right, where you and I are right now is in that battle. But we need to take heart in the midst of the darkness. One day the light will pierce the darkness. King Jesus will appear with thousands and thousands of angels and he is going to bum rush the darkness and he is gonna establish justice in all the earth and we can know that for certain because he will not grow faint. He will not be discouraged until justice has filled the entire earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the good news that we've heard this morning. Uh, And we pray, Father, for your spirit to just be poured out on this people here today, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, that we would go forth today seeking to obey the Great Commission, to, to share the news that is more glorious than any other news, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel knowing that it is your power for salvation for all who believe. Give us opportunity in the week to come uh, to engage our neighbors, uh, to talk with them about the Lord Jesus Christ, 
uh, to start Bible studies with them, to ask them to read Christian books. And we pray that you would use that to bring them to faith in Jesus. We pray that you'd help us to obey the great commandment and for the kids and teens by standing up to those who are being mistreated, for, for those who are being mistreated, by treating gently and tenderly those who are under our care or uh, not as strong as us. We pray that that would mark us as your people. Uh, help us, Lord, to be a force for good in our lives in the week to come. And we pray for anyone who doesn't know Jesus as this servant king who's establishing justice in all the earth. We pray that they would behold him with faith today, with eyes of faith, and that they would come to know him and see and experience his power to restore right order in their lives today. And we pray that you would do this for your glory and for our good. And all God's people said, amen.